Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. A few weeks ago, I made a video about the life, work and legacy of John Wycliffe, an individual who has come to be known as the Morning Star of the Reformation and someone whose name is still used in the title of the Middle English translation of the whole Bible. The Wycliffe Bible was not, however, the first time that the biblical text had been engaged with by English translators, but the earlier attempts resulted in only partial translations of the full Bible. Translating the Bible into English was not something that pleased everyone. In fact, it was, in some cases, a life-threatening pastime. Today, we're going to look at the English Bible that got the stamp of approval from King Henry VIII himself. But before we take a look at this, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to History Hit for sponsoring another video on this channel. History Hit has hundreds of programmes online, over 1,000 podcast episodes on their award-winning podcast network, and 5,000 history-related travel articles. And what's more, new content is being added all the time because they launch 15 new podcast episodes and two new programmes every week. Whilst Dan Snow's History Hit continues to be the world's leading history podcast, they now have four more podcast series. They have The Ancients, Warfare, God Medieval and Not Just the Tudors, which is hosted by Susanna Lipscomb. History Hit is like Netflix, but for history. A topic that has proven to be very popular on this channel is Elizabeth I's portraiture. In particular, the signs and symbols within it. I have good news for fans of this particular topic because if you subscribe to History Hit, you will be able to watch Dr Nicola Tallis and Professor Anna Whitelock's documentary called Painting Elizabeth, Creating a Royal Legend. Click the link in my description box to find out more and to subscribe to History Hit. As an added bonus, my viewers are able to get 50% off your subscription for the next three months by using code READINGTHEPAST. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video. And now it's time to take a look at the Great Bible of King Henry VIII. I'll let you into a little secret. My foremost reason in wanting to create this video is so that we can take a good look at this phenomenal frontispiece for the Bible that was authorised by Henry VIII that dates from 1539. But before we can do that, I do think it will be useful and indeed necessary for us to have a look at what came between the Wycliffe Bible and this. Wycliffe and his collaborators were working in the final decades of the 14th century, but it would be over a hundred years before the Great Bible would appear in 1539. So what happened in between? And why did the translation of the Bible cause such a kerfuffle? As I mentioned in my video on Wycliffe, the chronicler Henry Knighton was one of those who complained about the Bible being translated into English both because English was, quote, not the angel language, and because the translated Bible allowed, quote, the pearl of the gospel to be thrown before swine and trodden underfoot. And what is meant to be the treasure both of the clergy and the laity is now become a joke of both. The jewel of the clergy has been turned into the sport of the laity, so that what used to be the highest gift of the clergy and the learned members of the church, has become common to the laity. There were those who saw the creation of English Bibles as a gateway to heresy, or heresy in their own right. I have a video exploring the idea of literacy in the past that I will link for extra context on this, but suffice to say, there may be lay members of a community who were able to read aloud to their fellows. Now, if they were doing this in Latin, it might well require additional explanations, translation and definition from another person. That person would commonly be a member of the clergy who had been educated to read and understand Latin. But if the same text were to be available in English, 
then no such clerical mediation would be required. By making the biblical text available to those who could read in English, the text could be shared, discussed and interpreted in homes, taverns, maybe even in brothels. It was feared that if these discussions were to occur without a theologically trained and orthodox guide, then the group having them may fall into heresy and damnation, which in turn may eventually bring down God's displeasure upon the whole nation, especially if that heresy were allowed to spread unchecked. Additionally, as there had been no permission for these translations to take place, there was no oversight on how the passages were being translated. Choices might be made about certain words or phrases that would present a different significance. That significance may even be one that would threaten to destabilise the security, authority and power of the church and or the state. It didn't help matters that those striving to create English versions of the Bible, like Wycliffe, were also critical of the way the church was being run and sought to challenge many of its doctrinal claims. William Tyndale was born nearly a century after the death of John Wycliffe, but like him, he was keen to create an English version of the Bible, and he also called for the reform of the church. Tyndale was, however, clearly aware of both the difficulty and danger of pursuing his particular theological calling in England, because he decided to leave for the continent in 1524. The next year, in 1525, Tyndale was in Cologne, looking to publish his English version of the New Testament. But unfortunately, this work would be interrupted when the print shop of Peter Quintel was raided by the authorities, who believed, perhaps accurately, that Tyndale was in league with Martin Luther, and was therefore engaged in spreading an equivalent heresy to his. After all, the translation fragment made at Cologne is, it has been said, appropriately known as the Lutheran New Testament. Tyndale found sanctuary in the city of Worms towards the end of 1525, and there he restarted his work. His printed English New Testament was finally completed in 1526. Across his career, Tyndale would work from both Hebrew and Greek versions to produce his various English translations. But if we focus on his printed New Testament, Tyndale did make some interesting choices when it comes to translating certain terms. For example, Tyndale chose to translate the Greek term ecclesia as congregation rather than church a change that some saw as giving a dangerously heretical amount of agency to the laity in matters of faith. Along a similar line, for Tyndale, priest became senior and later elder. Charity became love and do penance became repent. Tyndale would not be permitted to complete a translation of the Old Testament to accompany his New Testament because while he was working on it, he would be betrayed. In the end, he was only able to publish the first five books, which does represent just the first quarter of the Old Testament. In 1535, Tyndale was seized at Antwerp. He was imprisoned, subjected to Inquisition, recognised as a heretic, before, in October 1536, being tied to a stake, strangled to death, and then his body was burned. In 1535, so the year before Tyndale's execution, Miles Coverdale oversaw the first printing of the entire Bible into English. In Coverdale's Bible, the Old Testament was translated from the Latin Vulgate and a collection of German texts, while the New Testament was a modification of Tyndale's translations. Coverdale dedicated his labours to King Henry VIII. However, as this translation did not come directly from a text in any of the original Bible languages, Hebrew, Greek or Aramaic, it was not deemed to be sufficiently scholarly for it to be either accepted or authorised to be used in Henry's Church of England. It's worth pointing out that despite the break from Rome, Henry VIII would remain suspicious of many of the changes that the evangelicals hoped to see implemented in and for the Church of England. 
he would outright refuse to enact some, and he would need to be both convinced and cajoled in regard to many others. The thought of a Bible in English was one of them. The process of persuading Henry about English Bibles was something that both Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Cranmer would work towards. Cromwell, as the king's vicegerent in spirituals, would look to place English Bibles in every parish church. In 1537, John Rogers, working under the pseudonym Thomas Matthew, published another version of the Bible in English that would also be dedicated to King Henry VIII. According to David Daniel, quote, On Tyndale's arrest, John Rogers had rescued his manuscript of the historical books Joshua to Two Chronicles and printed it in a complete Bible. The second half of the Old Testament was Coverdale's version. The New Testament was a reprinting of Tyndale's revision of 1534. So this would mean that the majority of this translation originated out of the Greek and Hebrew texts that Tyndale was known to have used, which in turn potentially makes this text sufficiently scholarly for use in the Church of England. However, before his capture and execution, Tyndale had earned the English king's animosity because he had written against Henry's annulment from Catherine of Aragon. So it's going to prove useful for those in favour of an English translation of the Bible to avoid presenting one that could be linked to Tyndale, or indeed it's going to be useful for them to find ways to obscure any connection that Tyndale may have had to the creation of a version of the Bible that they are trying to put into churches. In August 1537, Matthew's Bible was in England and Thomas Cranmer was sending it to Thomas Cromwell. We don't know if Cranmer knew that this translation was mostly the work of Tyndale, although we're fairly certain that Cromwell did. Regardless, Henry licensed this translation for sale and Cromwell promptly called for it to be placed in every parish church. 1,500 copies had been printed which would, of course, prove insufficient for the nearly 8,500 parishes that had churches. More Bibles would be needed. It was decided that Miles Coverdale should be tasked with revising the 1537 Matthews Bible in order to create what would become known as the Authorised Great Bible of King Henry VIII. While Tyndale's translation runs throughout this 1539 Bible, the more controversial elements have certainly been softened. And additionally, as we are about to see, the frontispiece is one massive ego stroke for the king. From the top, we have God emerging from the clouds. In the top right-hand corner, an ermine-adorned, robe-wearing, so obviously royal, figure is shown kneeling before that god, who in turn points towards him. This is King Henry VIII, who, like the biblical prophets, is shown to be in direct communication with the god that made him king and, as he would certainly profess, has guided his every action. But this is not the only time that Henry appears in this frontispiece, because he's also here, enthroned, and approximately four or five times bigger than the figure of God that has been positioned above him. Henry is the direct line to God, and this image overwrites and dismisses the place of the Pope as heir to St Peter, and it also dismisses the idea of the need for the clergy to intercede for the laity. Henry is God's representative on earth, as both a king and also as the supreme head of the church in England. To the left of Henry, as we look at this image, stands Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. He is bareheaded before his king, as the king had knelt bareheaded before God. Cranmer's mitre is shown on the floor beside him. Henry is handing him the verbum Dei, or the word of God. On the right of Henry stands a bareheaded Thomas Cromwell, to whom Henry is also handing the word of God. As we move down, we are shown Cranmer, now with his mitre back on his head, handing the word of God on to a bareheaded clergyman, while on the right, Cromwell, also back in his hat, 
hands the word of God to a hatless member of the laity. This is the social order at work. The divinely ordered great chain of being is shown to be flowing in the correct direction. Henry VIII's England, then, is in perfect working order. At the bottom of the image, people are shown crying, Vivat Rex, and God save the King, in their gratitude. The presence of both the Latin and the English forms of this particular exclamation highlights how the text behind this frontispiece will allow the Bible to be read and or understood by everyone, regardless of their educational opportunities or, indeed, of their rank in society. Biblical passages curl through this frontispiece. Interestingly, they are all in Latin. However, I will be translating them into English. If we return to the top of the page, God asserts, quote, I have found a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfil all my will. This passage comes from Acts 13.22. Henry responds with line 105 from Psalm 119, quote, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. On the other side, God announces the following from Isaiah 55.11, quote, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. The enthroned Henry speaks the following passages from his throne. To Cranmer, he says from 1 Timothy 4.11, These things command and teach. To Cromwell, from Deuteronomy 1, 16, 17. Judge righteously, hear the small as well as the great. In the larger speech bubble, if you will, Henry is appropriating Daniel 6, 26 with this quote. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the living God. Cranmer, when passing the word of God to the clergy, delivers the following line from 1 Peter 5.2. Feed the flock of God which is among you. While Cromwell, doing the same for the laity, recites Psalm 33.15. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. At the bottom, the individual preaching from the pulpit recites 1 Timothy 2.1-2. 2, 1 -2. I exhort, therefore, that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, etc. If this frontispiece is to be believed, then the question of faith in England is a settled matter. However, even this expertly crafted message in image form makes some reference to the ongoing discord. In the very bottom right of this image, we find a prison cell that holds two inmates, who are tellingly not joining in with all the cheering for King Henry VIII. What's this supposed to mean? Is it perhaps a warning against those who would think to deviate from the practice of faith as it was being set down, amended, reversed and reasserted at various points by Henry in his dual roles of king and also of supreme head of the English church. When we look at these inmates, it's unclear whether they are supposed to be too orthodox or too reformist. Maybe it's supposed to be unclear because either position could prove to be life-threatening in Henry's England following the break from Rome. Certainly, if the reforming evangelicals of England believed that the authorization of the great Bible in English was somehow evidence of the victory of their cause, they were not going to be able to celebrate for long. Because on the 28th of June, 1539, so in the very same year that the Great Bible was published, the Act of Six Articles became law. And this would walk back many of the elements that supported religious reform. Indeed, Miles Coverdale, like many others, would find it necessary to travel to the continent for his safety and he would remain abroad for the rest of Henry VIII's reign. But what do you think about the route to get an authorised Bible in English, about the frontispiece that I showed you, or indeed about anything else that we've looked at today? As always, 
I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. Or you can find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. So do follow me over on some or all of them so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please think about sharing it with your friends. Please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up. Please subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, do have a little check right now just to make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you. While you're there, checking, subscribing or resubscribing, you can hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down menu so that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.